And this year, during the holidays, as well as year-round, we um, speak a lot about missions at First Baptist and giving ourselves to the mission and to the hope of the gospel uh, being preached around the world. And so our emphasis each year at this time of year goes uh, toward an offering that's named after a young girl from Virginia named Lottie Moon, who was a single uh, woman who went to China uh, with the mission board as it was just being formed and went to a place far, far, far away or halfway around the globe. And there she proclaimed the gospel. There she invested in others. And there uh, her work was, was found to be absolutely effective as she allowed God to use her. And when many would say, well, I can't go because of all of the things that I have, uh, she gave up the opportunity for family, the opportunity for children, the opportunity uh, for uh, recognition to go and to give herself and so because of that uh, this offering was dedicated to her and so we want to be generous to give to the 3,500 others who are Southern Baptists who have given themselves to go to the ends of the earth and serve. We have family that do that in Israel and friends that are around the world and I hope you'll join our family in giving generously uh, to Lottie Moon. You guys are doing a great job. We're well on our way to our goal. But as we approach the end of the year, it's a great time to say, what am I giving? What am I doing in relationship to that? One of the gauges that has always been a part of our family is to basically look at what the most expensive Christmas gift was, what we spent on Christmas, and make sure that we exceed that when we give to Lottie Moon because Christ is the reason for the season because he is the most important. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the opportunity this year to... Uh, give to those who are giving their lives to you and to the hope of the gospel around the world. And we pray, God, that you will use them in great ways and pray that you will take our gifts and you will use them for the furtherance of your kingdom to the ends of the earth. Lord, we love you and we ask this prayer in the name of Christ. Amen. My name is David Edgel and I serve as the associate pastor here at First Baptist and so I'm privileged today to have opportunity to bring to you God's word. We're going to be in Colossians chapter 1. So if you have a Bible, turn to chapter 1. We'll be looking at verses 15 through 23. Um, as we uh, are in this Christmas season, <clears throat> we oftentimes talk about the baby Jesus, the Jesus, baby Jesus at the manger, baby Jesus born in Bethlehem. Baby Jesus that the angels sang of, or they, were, they were commanded to go and find this babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. But I think oftentimes our culture looks at this baby Jesus and views this baby in a manger, maybe not in the way that Scripture views Jesus. So I think it's always important whenever we speak of the hope of Christmas and speak of Jesus in the manger that we step back and we look at the broader picture of what's going on. This is one story in the overall story of redemption. This is the story of God uh, becoming man, taking on flesh, adding to his deity humanity. And in this passage that we're going to look at today, we'll see a larger picture of Christ. Because when we see Christ, we don't just see the cradle, we also see the cross. And when we see Christ, we just don't see the cross, we see a resurrected Christ. And when we see Christ, we don't just see him resurrected with his disciples on the earth, we see him ascended and lifted up the very throne of God in heaven. And he is there interceding for us. He is there because he is the Lamb of God, which all of creation uh, is, is going to be reconciled unto him as he calls the consummation of the age. And so Jesus is sent to men, but who is this man, Jesus? How does he govern? How does he impact your life? And so we're going to look at this passage in Colossians chapter 1, where Paul talking about spiritual maturity, talking about forgiveness, talking about being transferred from the dominion of darkness to the kingdom of light, takes a moment and gives us an, some insight into who Christ is. So I'm going to read this passage and then we'll come back and we'll look at each one of these sections in detail. Notice verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, 
whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth, things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated and hostile in your minds, expressed in your evil actions, but now he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you holy, faultless, and blameless before him. If indeed you remain grounded and steadfast in the faith and are not shifted away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, this gospel has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and I, Paul, have become a servant of it. So he starts off using this idea of the image of the invisible God. He says there in that verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God, the at firstborn over all creation. So the word that's used here of, of image is the word icon. It has this idea of likeness or representation, an image, a form, a manifestation, or a reflection. And so it implies that there's an outward manifestation and illumination of something's inner core or essence. Now I want you to notice something I'm doing. First of all, in your bulletin, you'll notice that there's a place for an outline. And so I'm giving you some things for you to write in those blanks and those places as we go through. So I want to, if you have a pen, I want you to have that out. Maybe take some notes while we're walking through this. But he uses this word icon. He, he's using it in a sense that Jesus is the representation. He's the reflection of who God is. Now, you... I'm sure over the last few days have been using your phone or camera or other things and you're taking pictures. You're taking pictures of images so you can save those. So that when you bring up that image later on and you say, look, this was us at Christmas. This was us last year. This was us when we were on vacation. And so we look at those things and we say, yeah, that's an image of you. That's not actually you. That's an image of you that represents a time and a place. But when Paul uses the word icon, he's using it in a way that Jesus is the actual representation. He is the reflection of who God is. That in his inner core and essence, Jesus is God. He is God in nature. He is God in the essence of, of his personhood, of who he is. And when you look at Jesus, you're seeing God reflected, God displayed for you in human form. You look at Jesus there in the manger, that's God humbling himself and adding to his deity humanity. You see Jesus walking among the disciples, that's God in human flesh there ministering and meeting needs. You see Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. That's God humbling himself and challenging them to understand the mission of the gospel. You see Christ resurrected and he is the image of the invisible God, fully represented for us. Christ is the representation and the manifestation of the God who is invisible. Now you say, well, in Scripture, it says that no one has ever seen God, but yet Christ, he has displayed him. And that's true. We don't, no one has ever seen God in the sense of him in heaven, fully uh, understanding his Trinitarian nature and Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and how all of that is working together, where the Father and the Son and the Spirit are one. 
And yes, no one has ever seen that full aspect of who God is, but Christ has revealed him. He has displayed him. He is the image of the invisible God. And so Christ there fully displays him as he is the image in the sense that he perfectly reveals God's nature. And Christ is not simply a picture of what God is like, but he is truly God himself. The Bible uses this term to refer to Jesus. Remember it? You've learned it. You know it. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That word only begotten means one of a kind, unique. Jesus is God in human flesh, and he is fully revealing him. And he gave us a picture, not just a picture of what God is like, but a truly true picture of God himself. But he doesn't stop there. He uses another term in verse 15. Toward the latter part of that verse, he says he is the firstborn of all creation. Now, some people have used this, this phrase, firstborn of all creation, in the sense that, is Je- does that mean that Jesus was created? Because if he's one, two, three, he's the firstborn, does that mean birth order? And that firstborn in, is used that way in scripture, yes, but firstborn does not always mean birth order. It can mean this idea of first, preeminent, the one who is the supreme, supreme in rank. And so the firstborn in the ancient world would often receive the inheritance. They would be the first in line and they would receive the majority of the inheritance. And so the firstborn in the family meant that they had a rank of a, of a high priority over other siblings that were there. But it's not just used in that sense. This idea of firstborn is used multiple times in Scripture. That Christ is firstborn from the dead. He is the firstborn over all creation. And it has the idea that he is the firstborn in terms of supremacy. That he is the one who is reigning. He is the one who is ruling. He is the one who has the uh, authority over all of creation. Now, he'll talk about that in these next set of verses. But before we go to those, I want to ask the question. Where is Christ in you? Do you look at him and see the character of God? Do you look at him and see that God was doing something when there was nothing that you could do to get to God, that God himself came to you and he gave himself for you, as we'll see in the verses in a minute. Is he supreme? Or are there many other things that are, you're placing over and above him? Where does he rank in terms of supremacy and preeminence in your life? a great question for us. Notice Paul goes on. He says, for everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, things that were visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. So Christ here is born. He's not just a creature who's been created. He is the creator himself. Notice that. For everything was created by him. And so unless Paul, unless you would wonder, well, what does that mean that all things were created by him? Well, he gives you an idea what he means by that. Does that mean the things that, were, that I can see and the things that I can't see? Yeah, visible or invisible? Does that mean the authorities that are here on earth are the authorities of the angels? Yes, thrones, dominions, rulers, or authorities. And in case you're wondering, he says all things have been created, have been created through him and what? For him. Think about that. That the very creator of the universe loved you so much. That existing in the very form of God laid aside the exercise of his attributes and added to his deity humanity and humbled himself into the womb 
of a, of a virgin, a young woman, to be born in a stable, a messy, dirty stable. And there, as she began to take that baby, and Mary and Joseph began to then take the claws that were given from the innkeeper and began to wipe the baby just as the shepherds would take a lamb and they'd begin to inspect those lambs to see if those lambs had any blemish. The very lambs that were being prepared for sacrifice in the temple, Mary takes those swaddling claws and she wraps that baby and she lies that, lays that baby there in a manger. That's God. That's the creator of the universe coming for you. Would not have, God could have just spoken from heaven. God could have just said, you're forgiven. But there was a debt. There was a larger a break. There was a larger separation between God and man that had to be resolved. And God's overall plan of redemption was that he would come in the person of Jesus Christ and humble himself. And he would live that life, that sinless life, and he would give of his physical body for you and for me. Now notice what he says here. We're talking about Christ, that he is the ruler of the universe. And if you look there in verse 17, it says, he is before all things, and by him all things hold together. Christ holds together the universe a cosmos, and he's holding it together for you and for me. Science looks at how an oxygen atom and how you have these neutrons and protons that are uh, positively charged and negatively charged and how it is that there's some force that's holding all of that together and how those just don't repel one another and just break apart. And science has, has studied that and look at that, and they try to understand what is the force that's holding all things together, that this, this universe that should be exploding itself apart is somehow being held together intricately, as almost as if the universe and the world were designed for man. The, if the earth were to move away from the sun further or closer, that would be catastrophic. If the moon were to come in closer, the tides would overwash the, the world. If our atmosphere had a sudden change, then it would be uninhabitable. But somehow, all of that existing in the universe, created by God, held together for all of us, and he says that Christ holds all things together. That's amazing. That he was existing before all things, and he's holding all things together. It speaks more of the lordship of Christ and who he is, that he is the Lord of creation. But I want you to see something else. Because he goes on in verse 18 and begins this description of how Christ is Lord of the church. Christ is Lord of the church. For he says, he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that everything, in everything, he might be preeminent. Now, I think that's interesting. When we talk about the church, he immediately turns from these large understanding ideas of Christ being given, that he is the image of God, that he is the creator of the world and of the universe, that he is the very sustainer of the universe, and then he immediately moves into this understanding of the church, that he's head of the church. And I think that's important because sometimes as the church, sometimes I wonder, oftentimes we get our priorities out of place because we need to realize that culture is not head of the church. We're not here to please culture and to understand culture better and to be a better expression of culture because Christ is head of the church. 
It's not my mere experience that when I come to church and say, okay, well, how do I feel about what's being said? How do I feel about everything that's going on around me? And so the, the head of the church becomes my experiences. Sometimes we look to the head of the church for people and leaders, and we want to see the, those leaders as the head of the church when Christ is the head of the church. And yes, sometimes even our politics, we want that to drive who we are and what we do and what the church is to accomplish. But we would come to this passage today and be reminded that the family in which we live, that we are born into this body of Christ, and all of those things do not drive the mission and the purpose of the church because Christ is the head of the church. He is the beginning, the alpha and the omega. So he has that right to be the head of the church. He is the firstborn from the dead. He is the resurrected Christ. He is risen, and he is preeminent over everything and over death, and he is the giver of eternal life, and so he is the head of the church. And Paul would say in everything that he might be preeminent. Folks, Christ is the head of the church, and we would do well to submit to his headship and to his lordship. But notice also he says, for in him, verse 19, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. Notice there that he is, he uses this statement, the fullness of God. All deity is found in him. Now the Colossians were struggling. They had been influenced by this group of teachers uh, they're called the Gnostics with a G-N-O, G -N -O, the Gnostics. And these Gnostics were teaching about Christ, that he was nothing more than a, a created being. He was one among other beings that emanated the glory of God. And yes, he had some spark of the divine in him, and that spark of the divine was necessary to know and to understand. But yet outside of that, there was a knowledge that you had to have, a secret knowledge. And there was this understanding that your body in and of itself was evil, but your spirit was good. And so if you could just put away the evil in your body and just think spiritual things or meditate on spiritual things, really sometimes it didn't even matter what you did with your physical body, only if you were thinking spiritual things. And Paul would stand against that. And he would say, Christ came to reconcile you. Christ came. And there wasn't just a part of deity dwelling in him, but all the fullness of God was in him. All the fullness of God, all that it meant to be God was in him. But my mind goes to the transfiguration where there God is speaking from heaven. And the Shekinah glory of God is, is there. And the Spirit of God is there. And Jesus is there then transformed and we see this this glory of God revealed and at that moment we see that there in that picture of the of the God of the universe that all the fullness of deity is dwelling in Christ and when you look at Christ he is God and because he is God he is reconciling this world to himself because he is the Lord of reconciliation now I think it's interesting sometimes when we look at these passages on salvation, our culture has become very dualistic in and of itself. We've slipped into this mindset that somehow what I really do with my physical body really doesn't matter as much as long as there's a spiritual aspect of my life. This is really from Buddhism. Buddhism says that, you know, that, that, sin, is, that, that sin and life is just suffering. And so your body's going to give itself towards sin. So every once in a while, it's, it's good just to indulge in that. But as long as you spend time in meditation, as long as you spend time in the spiritual things, and as long as you have this sense of you're communicating with the divine, then you will reach this position of enlightenment. And American culture loves that idea. 
that I can still give myself to the world. I can still invest myself in the things of the world. I can still invest myself in the things of the flesh. But as long as I have some kind of spiritual life, as long as I'm doing some kind of spirituality on the side, then somehow I will see the glory of God someday. And that is a lie straight from the pit of hell. Because Christ is, was in a physical body. He came because your physical body exists in sin. And God's idea is to transform us, to change us. That yes, we are broken. Yes, we live in the flesh. And yes, we are, our tendency is toward the world. But God came. God gave himself. In this verse he says he was reconciling himself, making peace through the body of on the cross. And then notice verse 21. And you were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, and he has now reconciled in his body of the flesh to his death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. See, it wasn't enough for God just to say, okay, you're forgiven. Wouldn't be enough for God to just come and say, well, I think as long as you change in some way, that will be enough. Because the problem of sin, the problem of the brokenness of man, the problem that we have is not merely in a spiritual sense, it's in a physical sense as well. Because we were born into sin our bodies, we are sinners by nature and by choice. And we commit sin in our physical body. And so if there's going to be a forgiveness of sin, then that meant there had to be an exchange. Those lambs were, would come to the temple and there the priests would confess the sin over those lambs and those lambs would pay a price so that the so that the guilty could go free and this innocent lamb would give its life so that the ransom could be paid. There was an exchange. And you and I stand guilty before God. And we are fully children of wrath. We are fully under His wrath. But only by the grace of God, only by the physical body of Christ coming, indwelling, God taking on human flesh and living among us, and Him taking on the form of man and humbling Himself to a servant, but not just to a man, not just to die, but to die a death on a cross. And it was there that His blood was shed, as you saw in that verse it was there that his body was given. It was there that that exchange was made when God turned his wrath, his propitiate, we, Christ became the propitiation, and God turned his wrath away from us. And grace and salvation and transformation comes to us. That has to be by faith. That has to be when we transfer our trust from trusting in ourselves and trusting in Christ alone. But notice there, he said that he was reconciled by his physical body because once we were alienated, we were hostile, hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. But now, he says, because of his body, now because of his death, now, Christ, in order, is now going to present you holy and blameless and above approach before him. That's amazing. That because of that, God no longer looks at me as I was. God looks at me as I am in Christ. Once in rebellion, once alienated, once hostile, but now, notice what he says, holy, faultless, blameless. 
That God could look away from that and he could see me through the righteousness and the hope of Christ? Yes, yes, and yes. And God wants to change us. He wants to transform us. And in that moment of salvation, he does that. But that new creation that he makes you in Christ is still living in the old body with thoughts and images and desires. And that's why God indwells us with the Holy Spirit. That's why God is in the transforming business because he wants us to live out what is true, not about how I used to be, but who I am. He wants to transform me into the new person that I am in Christ. And so why would I invest myself in those things when I could invest myself in the things of God, in the things of Christ, in the things of his kingdom, and begin to live out what it means to be holy, begin to live out what it means to be faultless, begin to leave, live out what it means to be blameless before God. There are so many passages. Paul will go on later in this book of Colossians chapter 3, and I challenge you to read that and see how he says, you were once this, but now you are to put those things away and put on Christ. He looks at, you can look at the passages in Ephesians chapter 4 and how the talks about the old man and being renewed in the mind and living in the image and the reflection of Christ. And so God is in the transforming business. And but notice what he says in verse 23. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all of creation. Now that's an interesting phrase. God wants to do this. He wants to move you from being alienated, should be alienated, hostile in mind, to transform you to holy, faultless, and blameless. But he says here, notice that verse there, if indeed you continue in the faith. So is God unsure if I can do it? Does that mean that if I don't remain steadfast in the faith, that somehow I had it and then I lost it? No, it's not what it means. But what it does mean, and this, we use this phrase a lot of times in different ways, it has more of an idea as you continue steadfast in the faith. That if there is a genuine experience of salvation, that you're going to continue in the faith. You're going to continue to live out that faithfulness. You're going to continue to be stable and steadfast. Your hope's not going to shift from one thing to another. Where, you know, do I have it today? Do I not have it today? Is my, my hope's in, in my flesh today? Is my hope in Christ? Where's my hope today? No. If you are in Christ, you'll walk in the steadfastness of faith. And oftentimes, we don't do that for two reasons. One, Jesus talks about in the parable of the soil, that sometimes we hear things and we see things and we think, yeah, I want that for myself. And we go after that, but we don't go after it because there's not been a genuine rebirth. It's just something that interests us and then it fades away. It appears as if we have that, but our motivations were for ourselves and not for the glory of Christ. But if we allow God to transform us, if we allow that exchange to happen in salvation, that the genuineness and the authenticity of your faith is going to be seen in the steadfastness of you walking in that faith. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, this gospel that's being proclaimed around the earth, because that will be the heart of who you are. Paul said he's a servant of the gospel. A servant. That it was the gospel that brought him to the point of understanding who Christ was. That Christ died for his sins and was buried and rose again. And when he saw the exalted Christ for Paul, nothing was the same. And he gave himself fully to the gospel. 
I think sometimes we confuse, though, and part of the problem we, we struggle with this is because we confuse the idea of the gospel. That somehow the gospel is something that's meant for this beginning point of salvation. So I receive the gospel, and so now I, I understand the gospel, and so I'm a believer in faith. But we think that that's all the gospel is when it is not. Because the gospel is the good news of salvation. And that is the beginning point, but that is not the ending point. Because all of life must be lived through the lens of the gospel. All of life, I must preach the gospel to myself. That there is nothing in myself that is good. There is nothing in myself that allowed me to receive grace. It's only by the power and the love of God that he came and gave himself for me. And I heard that gospel and through the power of God I responded to that gospel. And now I'm living that out day by day. But that grace isn't something that's a one and done. Grace is something that we need every day. And that happens as we gather through as the body of Christ. And as we see the baptism, we see the grace of God in new birth as people come to faith in Christ. We gather as a body of Christ and we take the elements of the Lord's Supper. And there we're reminded that it was the grace of God that brought me to salvation. And it is the grace of God that will carry me forward until the Lord Jesus comes. And as we gather together, we experience the grace of Christ together in the Lord's Supper, and we understand that the gospel is not just for a point in life. The gospel is for all of life, that we would know and understand and live our lives in the glory of him. And when you give yourself to the gospel, you will be a servant of the gospel because you want others to know. Same author of Colossians, Paul writing in another letter to the Corinthian church, actually called 2 Corinthians, wrote these words. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. Everything is from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, Christ, God, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses, their sins against them, as he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. So therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. And since God is making his appeal through us, we plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And then notice this last verb. For he made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That is a beautiful, beautiful set of verses. I hope you will read that, you will study that, you will understand that, and you will see that Christ is is our hope. So what do I do with this? How do I, what do I take away from this? Well, first, Christ is Lord. And you must bow to his lordship. One day, Philippians 2 in a similar passage says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You can't walk away and not react to the Lordship of Christ. I think another thing that I think from this passage that we can walk away with is that Jesus is the creator and he's created you with a purpose. Do you know you're created in the image of God? And it is through Christ that he's remaking that image in you. And when you have Christ, there's a remaking of that image to be the reflection of Christ Another thing for us as a church is Christ is the head. And we need to follow him and we need to allow him to transform our lives because we as a body of Christ are a body of transformed believers, transformed, reconciled to God. And Christ is the reconciler 
and we have a message to proclaim to the others. Those shepherds went because they were excited about the message that they had heard. The good news of great tidings. The same word that's used there, gospel, is the same word that we use for gospel. And they knew that there was a message to proclaim. And I hope maybe if today through the preaching of this text that you would see that Christ wants you to be a reconciler, an ambassador of you. If you're here and you say, well, this is all new to me. I don't, I don't know what it means to be a Christian. I don't know what it means to be a follower of Christ. We want to talk to you. We want to know and want you to know the hope of Christ. But if you're a believer here today, this passage is something that you should walk away with an understanding of my life is given to something greater. My life has a purpose. My life as a believer needs to reflect the hope and the glory of Christ. And I have a message of Christ. Christ recon reconciling himself to the world that I need to be proclaiming. And I hope with you and me together we can do that as we take the hope of Christ to our community. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the great reminder today in this passage of what it means to be a follower of you, to what it means to be a follower of the way, the way of Christ. And so, Lord, I pray today that you would do your work today in the lives of those who might be here that don't know you, that they would know you, that they would turn to you, that they would say and acknowledge They have sinned, and they're in need of a Savior, and that through faith and trust and belief that they would cry out to you as your Spirit draws them to yourself. Lord, I pray that today. But Lord, I pray for those who are here that are believers. We need to be reminded of your Lordship. We need to be reminded of your preeminence. We need to be reminded that you love us and that the gospel was not the beginning merely but that the gospel is something that will carry us to your presence in heaven and that we would live out the hope and the truths of the gospel every day in our lives or thank you for the hope of christ thank you for the opportunity to celebrate today and as we um, close this service and worship may our worship turn to the god of creation the reconciler of the world, Jesus Christ. Lord, we love you.